this panel on trade uh, across regions that share uh, the Indian Ocean. So we're looking about trade across South Asia, the Middle East, uh, and Africa. We've all come to acknowledge the fact that trade is a major engine of growth uh, across the world. Uh, and many nations have uh, revolutionized their economies through trade, I mean, going back to Japan, South Korea, uh, and China. So the question we are presenting, uh, we, are, we are going to debate, or we're going to discuss today, uh, is about how to enhance trade across South Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. Now, these are large economies in terms of the size of the population, but in terms of uh, the share of world trade, this still is a small part, especially South Asia and Africa, is a small part of trade. There's been a large increase in South-South trade, but most of that has been kind of intra-Asia, mostly East Asian economies and Southeast Asian economies, much less South Asia uh, and Africa. And the Middle East is well known for its uh, oil exports. Uh, uh, the question is whether we can uh, think of other areas that it could diversify into. Uh, we have uh, a, a great group of speakers to comment on this topic with a lot of experience in this area. To my left, I have Priyanka Mittal, who is the director of KRBL India. I have Vineet Nair, who is the vice chairman and CEO of HCL Technologies. And to my right, I have Mohammed Jafar, who is the chairman and managing director of uh, Kuwaiti Danish uh, Dairy Company uh, of Kuwait. So we have two representatives from the South Asia side, from the India side, and we have, uh, we have Mohammed who's from the Middle East, and we are missing one of our speakers who would have been uh, from Africa, but I assume we can get some good questions from the, from the audience on this. So the way I want to uh, proceed on this topic is to break it down into three parts, which is first start with a discussion about the unique opportunities that the region affords. Uh, and then speak about the challenges that we face in growing trade uh, within the, across this, these different uh, uh, regions. And then, con and then in the end, talk specifically about best practices and solutions to address these challenges and how to grow trade. So let me come to uh, the opportunities. Let me start with Priyanka. So Priyanka, you are uh, heading an agro-based company. Uh, and you have uh, ma many dealings with the Middle East. You're a big uh, exporter to the Middle East. So maybe you can start with telling us about what you see as some of the unique opportunities that exist for trade across this region in the agro-based agro sector and in related sectors. Okay. Uh, Geeta, I'd like to start by saying that uh, there's great opportunities to trade with neighbors, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and I don't think that potential is fully harnessed. I'll start by sharing a statistic that um, intra-regional trade uh, roughly accounts for 65% of European Union's total trade, 51% for NAFTA, 25% for ASEAN, and 16% for Mercosur. However, the ratio is just 5% for SAFTA, despite excellent infrastructure. So that's a low-hanging fruit that is up for grabs. Now, obviously, there are a lot of benefits for intra-regional trade, particularly in the SARC area, political stability, labor mobility. Um, you know, culturally, we understand them better. We can spec and customize the product better. Um, there's obviously a freight advantage. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently, the issue that has garnered a lot of attention is carbon footprinting. So trading with neighbors actually reduces that substantially. Now, a lot of work has happened India has made a lot of initiative with Pakistan trying to develop intra-regional trade. And in December 2012, last year, we signed the MFN. And we will see that that area of trade increase in future years. But I think that's a low-hanging fruit. You know, that, that should have been done similar to other regions. With regard to the Middle East, you know, we have India has primarily been a raw materials exporter. So, I think there is great opportunity to go up the value chain. I can give you our example as KRBL. Rather than just being a raw materials exporter, we've actually gone into value addition and we're actually exporting brands. So we're capturing that value addition in India. So there are two aspects to the, to the issue here. One is to actually not only raise 
the value of trade, but also raise the, the kind of trade that you do. You know, we can get into more manufactured-centric trade, get into more knowledge-based trade, you know, and, and thereby enhancing not only just being a raw materials provider, but actually uplifting the entire value chain and capturing that value in the supply chain. Now, what happens is Southeast Asia typically exports raw material to, let's say, the West. The West does the value addition, and then it is exported to the Middle East. In that sense, then the value is captured by right. people there. So if you actually directly value add the product at source of origin, where the raw material is generated, right. you will actually capture significantly more value. Well, that's great. So it, it's, it sounds like besides having a comparative advantage in a particular product, you want to be able to move up the value chain. Absolutely. And uh, come up with more branded products for which you then... Uh, you know, have a significant market share in these in these different regions. So I want to move on to Vineet. Um, you're in a completely different industry. You're in uh, IT, and for you, from your perspective, are these regions uh, a market for you as a destination, or are you basically sourcing skilled manpower to you know to fuel your your service trade with uh, North America and uh, Europe? I, I, before answering that question, Kita, if I can step back and answer that, where is the opportunity right. I see, right? Uh, most of us actually uh, are existing with the Western hat on our head, uh, assuming that's the market uh, which we are all focused on, and we need to produce either raw material or goods or services for the Western market. Uh, and uh, each one of us are doing our own bit. Uh, in our own way and without li looking at the collaborative enterprise and what potentially it could it could do for us to even pursue that agenda. Uh, EU is a very strong example of intra-trade uh, based growth. That means how do you trade within that region uh, so that you can grow. However, this experiment could be a different experiment, which is where your question is going. So what you can trade within, is that an attractive opportunity? Yes and no, because the opportunity in the West is far bigger than the opportunity within, within, uh, within this region. However, what you can do collaboratively to leverage and deliver better value and better services to the West is a very interesting opportunity. Most of the people in West see a risk in a single country outsourcing, whether it is a supply chain or sourcing or IT or whatever it is. And therefore, they, they, they seek uh, multi-country collaboration, mm -hmm. whether it is India and Philippines or Malaysia and India or Middle East and India or South Africa and India increasingly. And when you do that, the question is, do you appear as one or do you appear as virtually two separate companies uh, which are trying to deliver to the same customer? And so far, because of the trade barriers, we appear as two separate companies, uh, two separate companies in two, in two separate countries. And therefore, what we have on offer uh, to US or Europe is not very cohesive, and therefore it's not a single value proposition. So the big opportunity in my mind is a billion people in South Africa, a billion in India, and a, you know, half a billion all around, is the human capital we have. That's the bigger raw material we have. In our age, 50% of the age is less than 30 of this, uh, this population. So how can we leverage this raw material, and how can we collaborate collectively and raise the level of this raw material to deliver higher value added services to the West and redefine globalization. Today, globalization is all about West going to East, and therefore you talk to any Western company, their biggest opportunity is going East. Yeah. So how can we redefine globalization about East going to West by better collaboration and leveraging these two and a half, three billion people to be able to pursue the dreams which all of us have in the emerging market? That's great. So. It looks like in terms of opportunities, we've raised two sets. One is about the market itself as a source, as a market to sell to. And the point you raised about leveraging the skilled manpower in the region, not necessarily to sell to the markets in that region, but to sell to markets uh, in, outside. in outside. So let me come to you, uh, Mohammed. What, in your opinion, are the opportunities that cooperation in this region uh, can bring about? I think when you look at the region and what it has to offer, um, it, it has a lot to offer. It has people to offer. You have uh, the, the middle classes of Africa and India alone uh, are the new consumers. Uh, the Canadian Prime Minister yesterday said he's not waiting for Doha to happen. Right. 
uh, they're having bilateral agreements quickly. They're interested in, um, uh, in India. Energy, hungry India. Um, you also have, you know, what's, we were talking about the Indian Ocean, but there's what lies beyond the Indian Ocean, you know, beyond the coast. So you've got China, you've got Central Africa, and just um, the shores of Africa. So it has people to offer uh, uh, markets. Um, tackling trade um, was addressed by a number of organizations. You have ASEAN, yeah? you have um, IOC, the Indian Ocean Rim. You have uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council within uh, the Gulf. Right. Um, they all have existed for many years to facilitate trade within those particular regions. And now we have a very wide brush where we want those various uh, countries around the Indian Ocean to cooperate. I think it's a great challenge. I think first, for the opportunity to happen, you need to refocus. Uh, who's going to, um, like the Canadians, coming with a small trade delegation to a specific country? I think the um, execution uh, mechanism for these opportunities to take place has to be uh, revisited. The um, trade within the GCC, for example, in the Gulf countries, is nil. Um, and I think you have to examine if you're unable within a sub-region to trade, why is it that you're unable to trade within this sub-region? And is it ambitious to trade outside the region? It's easy to sell oil because there's demand for uh, oil today, but what lies uh, right. beyond the uh, obvious? So the opportunities here you know, in, in India, uh, infrastructure in Africa, uh, infrastructure uh, uh, again, um, and agriculture. So you've got the people, but also you have the means to produce uh, uh, food. And I think that uh, these are priorities by sector, priorities by country that need to be identified to get the ball uh, rolling. And I think the new model of public-private partnerships must, and the change in mindset must start to exist so that these opportunities that have existed for a long time, the populations didn't appear yesterday, the uh, arable land didn't just appear yesterday. They've been here for a long time. How do you turn that into a reality? Right. So, I mean, this is, this is a good point to start bringing up the specific challenges. So, it, I mean, we all agree that the opportunity If, if exists. I could add one more opportunity sure. here, because, you know, what, what you're saying is absolutely right. I think what's happening is that over a period of time, because of this whole Western mindset coming East in a very dominant way, uh, we don't think cooperation, we think consumption. And therefore, our mindset is how can we consume more like the West? And uh, what is actually needed to solve either the social problems or economic problems or diversity problems is more local solutions, more innovative solutions. And there are a huge number of innovative solutions, whether you take the Jaipur Fort on one side or you take low-cost education, we will never have the teachers which we would need. So a whole lot of solutions are there, whether they are in South Africa or India and the Middle East. I think if, if there was an agreement of sorts to try and cover some of the social issues by leveraging the local innovation we have, right. uh, people will start seeing the benefit of leveraging innovations from each other and the commerce will come later. Otherwise, what's happening is that we are trying to force fit the Western solutions, even to social problems. You take water, you take irrigation, you take all those medicine, you take all those, we are trying to ape the West to try and solve a local problem, which is not going to be possible. So even at the government level, if not the trade, you know, trade is a very sensitive topic in terms of, you know, what you will and what you're not, and it needs infrastructure. But even if you try and encourage social innovation labs, frugal innovation labs, to try and encourage solution of social problems by leveraging capability from each other, I think that that conversation within the region would start. Right. So I mean, we're talking here about having regional cooperation, not just purely trade-based, trade, yeah. but in terms of transfers of social technology, uh, you know, solutions that address problems that are specific to the region that you won't find solutions in the West yes. uh, for. And I think, uh, but it sounds like these are complements, right? To some extent, yeah. by actually improving the social infrastructure in the region the physical infrastructure in the region and by transferring technologies across the region, you might actually enhance trade uh, also in the, in the process. And so these are the kinds of opportunities that we are thinking about. 
And so we all agree there are great opportunities, but still, if you look at the numbers, in terms of trade in the region, we're talking about small numbers. And so let's try to get a little specific about what we think are the challenges to growing trade. Uh, now, we know that there are kind of explicit uh, barriers to trade, which is tariffs. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you look at the tariff barriers between the, north and the, uh, between the North and the South, they're actually less severe than across countries in the South. And then, of course, there are non-tariff barriers, which is the physical infrastructure that doesn't exist, financial capital, things of those kinds. So let me go around and get your uh, opinion on what you think are the specific uh, challenges to growing trade and through more, and more regional cooperation in this region. Well, I'd like to start by saying that I think one of, one of the biggest challenges is non-harmonization of standards. So, so let's say when you deal with Africa as a continent, and you go to Kenya versus Tanzania versus Nigeria, uh, South Africa, the standards are vastly different for any product, whether it's agriculture, non-agriculture, manufactured products. And by the time you get the safety data done, by the time you get the compliances done, you're losing time, and you're losing an opportunity to trade. So they need, and you're actually incurring resources. You're incurring time, you're incurring money in trying to seek those approvals. And that, that phenomena is not an Af Africa-specific phenomena. That happens even in SARC, it happens in ASEAN, it happens in the West. I think there needs to be greater collaboration now regionally to uniformly apply the standards. You know, there should be just one body that regionally does it. That's why you gain a lot of efficiency um, in, in implementing and, and making trade seamless. I think that is the first constraint. The second, of course, is mobility of labor, which, which I think, Vineet, is something that you'd, you'd probably, an issue that's very close to your heart, is mobility of labor. And I think that also is a restrictor to trade. You know, I think one of the big benefits of the European Union was, was uniform skills enhancement and mobility of labor, which actually improved the value of, and the value of trade, the volume and the value of trade. And I think with, with India or the Middle East, India and Africa, that's an open opportunity that's up for grabs. You know, from, a, from skills enhancement perspective, uh, from visa perspective and mobility perspective. The third, of course, which, which is actually very, very uh, inherent to agriculture is protection of intellectual property. You know, there, there's great intellectual property that exists in SARC, you know, with, whether it's, it's rice, it's silk, it's tea, you know, Ghana coffee, uh, Kenyan tea. Mm -hmm. I think that intellectual property needs to be jointly registered so that the farmers, you know, or the enablers of that trade benefit from that value rather than somebody which is more developed trying to grow it and sell it cheaper. So thereby destroying the, in, the entire value. So those are the three primary things that, that I'd like to see. That's great. So uh, Vineet, what do you think? I mean, I, I, I think I completely agree with all three. And I can see progress being made on harmonizing of standards. Mobility of labor sounds like a much tougher uh, proposition. but Curious to know what you think. Yeah, so I, I completely agree with what she has said. But let me ask the question in terms of why it is not happening and go at challenges from that point right. of view. I think the start point is that the small businesses uh, are the real benefit beneficiary of this trade. Uh, because large corporations somehow find markets uh, across the world and somehow sustain growth and somehow have enough cash to be able to take the difficult path of going, going west. The small businesses, the, if you really see the India-Pakistan agreement came out of a huge amount of small businesses putting adequate pressure on their local governments to say that you know it makes sense to have this trade barrier rifted and therefore we have almost a 50 or 100 percent growth year on year with Pakistan. So the first question is, do the small businesses in the respective countries have a voice in the governance or is it dominated by the big business houses. That's the first part. If the small businesses don't have a voice, do industry forums have a voice? In this particular case, in Pakistan case, the industry forum had a voice. Mm -hmm. So what industries are going to benefit out of it? And do industry forums of the two countries see eye to eye, and therefore do they have the voice in bringing about a change in the government policies in all the sectors which you talked about? What is really happening is the industry forums are also weak in the emerging markets. They are very strong in the developed markets because they are well contributed to. Uh, we hate to contribute to in industry forums. We do not see a value in industry forums, and industry forums do not produce too much return for the businesses, and therefore they are weak. 
And I think growing the industry forums, specifically in this region, specifically for local trades, specifically for small businesses, is the other challenge we face. I think the third issue on global mobility, I don't think we should brush that aside in terms of the fact that it is difficult to do. Uh, the European example which you, which you said is, is, you know, right standard is standing in front of us in terms of if we have, if we only take one decision, which is global mobility, all, all the stuff which you're talking about will automatically happen because people will start moving around, innovation will start moving around, people will start collaborating because this is a big consumption market. And if the consumer gets together, then the buyer will have to behave himself, whether it is IP, whether it is, you know, those are big issues there. And that collaboration will either happen through policy or trade agreements, or it could happen through global mobility. And if we ease the global mobility, as it is the global mobility between UK and, and US is very, very easy, within EU is very easy. If we just take that decision of global mobility at the educated level, let's forget the labor market, at the educated level, if you have a good global mobility standards, I think a lot of these challenges, you know, which appear challenges, will start solving themselves. I think it is answering these three questions uh, which would try and solve some of the issues which Priyanka is saying. So in my mind, these are the challenges, that nice. we are focused on that. Let's focus on the cause of why are we not able to do what she's saying, despite the fact it looks so obvious for us to do. It's, it's interesting. Neither of you brought up uh, the tariff barriers as, as being a big constraint. That they're actual, I mean, you, you seem to be referring to more of the softer constraints on trade rather than the more direct, observable, measurable constraints. Do you not see those as being constraints? So I think that is an obvious constraint. You know, that is, I think, the one thing that has hampered trade for a very long time. But, you know, that's something that's, that's happened, you know, has existed for, for a very long time. There has been a lot of discussion about it. But uh, because of reasons of internal security, with regard to food, with regard to labor, protecting smaller industries, you know, those tariffs entail. I think recently also, you know, those tariffs have become a tool for negotiation, you know. Uh, there's a lot of give and take that happens, and I think artificially keeping the tariffs high, there's, there's a certain give which the developed world does, you know, in lieu for something take from the developing world. So I think there's, there's a bigger, bigger agenda, you know. Tariff is a very, very politically sensitive, economically sensitive, social sensitive issue, and to... To wish that, you know, it completely goes away, I think is just right. wishful thinking. It's not going to happen in the foreseeable future. You know, economics has argued the, the, the benefits of, of competitive advantage, et cetera, for, for removing barriers. But that has only been discussion, you know. There's what, what is the solution really? Right. I mean, if you look at a, at a broad period of time, right. I think the world has recognized that you need to have freer trade. And so you have absolutely seen uh, a cut in tariffs across time. So I think we're moving in the right direction. But, uh, I mean, you have specific experience. I know that you, you, were, you were interested in uh, sugar exports from, uh, from Africa, and, you, and the specific problem there was about tariffs. Could you speak to that? Um, I think tariffs, the um, hard and the, the hard tariffs are clear. You know, it's 20% if you're importing. The soft tariffs, even sometimes when there is not a hard tariff, are worse because they cannot be measured, but they're very uh, real. The example from Africa is, is one, is a case in point, but also in Jordan, we try to export some food products to Jordan. Uh, officially, there is no tariff, or there's a particular tariff which is disguised as something else. Um, but then the procedures and the red tape upon arrival, basically, once you've experienced that once or twice, you lose, you know, you, you lose the appetite for exporting. Um, Tanzania produces sugar. We're interested in buying some sugar from Tanzania. I was there recently. This is why this was fresh. Um, they have banned the export of sugar. They do not allow sugar to be exported. Um, the sugar exporters want to export the sugar, but the government, and I think this is one of the problems, is, is the, there is a protectionist gene that so, seems to supersede um, the free trade gene in many countries. This needs to be addressed, especially in hard times when there is hardship. This protectionist instinct comes in, and you don't want to export rice, you don't want to export uh, uh, sugar. If we want to export uh, foodstuffs, not oil, to India, there are tariffs, there are barriers that, um, that don't allow that. 
I think the challenges are fragmentation. It's too disparate a bunch around this uh, Indian Ocean rim. Uh, the priorities of the Indian PM are different from the priorities of the South African PM, the Australian PM, or the Jordanian PM. Um, how do you deal with this fragmentation? The mindset is important. I think um, believing that in trade lies the solution, if that is not at the core, uh, it will be doomed like Doha has been doomed. It will get nowhere. The initiative at the end of the day will be left to the private sector. But is it possible, and this also has to do with, with, with mindset, is there trust? Does government trust business? Does business trust government? Uh, I think there's a worldwide crisis of trust that translates into everything that we do today. Um, the consumer doesn't trust the media, doesn't trust government, doesn't trust corporation. And um, un until there is trust between the uh, business community, the uh, politicians, Internally, before you go regionally, establish that at home, and then try to export it. But there are, um, I mean, we'll be moving to, to solutions later, there, there, there are solutions. It's not that, you know, this is a problem without solutions. But I think my reading is that um, you need to reduce the complexity. Um, people within India complain of how difficult it is to do trade from state to state harmonization not only of standards, but harmonization of taxes. You know, it's a nightmare. The right. time that it takes to do business within. So if that is softened, if it is possible to be as a European Union, but as a federation of in the states, you have it from different <coughs> state to state, you have different taxes. There are differences, but they are not major differences that force uh, a newcomer to really look at the system and say, this is totally foreign to me. I need three years just to understand how to navigate the system. Right. So um, reducing the complexity, the fragmentation, having a mindset and um, a coalition of the willing, uh, including um, non-government organizations, including uh, a government, including the right stakeholders. You have to bring to the table the right people. It has to be the right table. It must be the right topic that they're talking about and put some metrics in there to get some deliveries coming out. I think this is the... Uh, so, so uh, Vinny, can you tell us a little bit, you've had experience dealing, you know, trading and services with different parts of the world. Can you give us an example of, you know, why is it that much harder to do trade with the, with the countries you're talking about as opposed to, say, uh, a country in North America or in, in Europe? I mean, is there, is there something we could specifically point to as being a clear sense of the differences of doing trade across uh, uh, these different sets of nations? I, I think the first is the mindset that West is better and uh, doing business with, you know, your own... Do you think that's a mindset and there's nothing first, fundamental? No, I'm, I'm going down, okay. down the line. For first, it does start with the mindset. Uh, somewhere in our genes, since he's talking about genes, there's also a gene called a brand gene. That means a Western brand gene uh, is even if it is on the verge of bankruptcy, uh, I like to buy that car rather than buy a car of a very profitable local company. So it's it's in our genes and you know cuts across uh, region. Now the second is when we talk like brothers, it what is in it for me becomes a very important question to ask. Uh, and in every conversation it comes up. Uh, you know, it means multiple things. Uh, some said, some unsaid, uh, but. But that becomes a very difficult thing, that in every argument, in every conversation, whether it is with the custom guy, whether it is with the government, whether it is with the education institution. Case in example, South Africa has a billion people. One of the things which we are very interested in is setting up our centers uh, of local development in South Africa. And we said we would like to have 10,000 people in five years in South Africa doing software development. And that's that's a commitment we would like to make, and the reason is because South Africa will be a very large consumption market on its own. Uh, the second is that South Africa would also be leveraged by a lot of regions who go into South Africa uh, to try and sell, and South Africa will force and export, and therefore South Africa is a great destination for us to be. So it's a pure commercial logic for us. South Africa development of talent 
education institutions, you know, with reference to IT, is, is quite, it's quite not there. And therefore, the task for us, if we are serious about it, is to how do we uh, engage with the education institutions and with the local government to try and set up centers so that the engineers out there, we can take them and convert them to learn the business processes and to learn the CMMI and all those standards in software industry so that we can deploy them into our centers and that, that becomes. Now there is where the difficulty is, that if you have a similar conversation with the state governor in let's say US, uh, it's an across the table decision, uh, which is the reason we are in Seattle, we are in North Carolina, it's easy to set up, your subsidies are easy, your tax laws are easy, everything is easy, you're done and dusted in about seven days time. It's been three years with South Africa. Uh, predominantly because everybody is saying, what is in it for you, what is in it for me, who's, who's going to be the decision maker, am I the decision maker, is somebody else, there is no one decision maker, and therefore, the concept everybody likes, the idea everybody wants to own, execute nobody wants to do. And I'm sure when you come to India, you face the same thing. Who are you talking to? Is there one decision maker? So I think the biggest challenge in the emerging market is we are not decisive, uh, we are biased, and we do not have an architecture and a structure where we can take these bold decisions and execute them. We can take a decision, but we don't know how to execute them. And that's, I think, where the challenge is. Great. So I think we are, it, it sounds like this also tells us about what needs to be done to address the problems and address uh, the, the fact that there's total trade in the region. Uh, so Priyanka, let's move on to now the solutions part of the, of the discussion and say, okay, if, if you had to think of... Uh, uh, what, in your opinion, are the important steps that need to be undertaken to, to solve these challenges, what would they be? Um, well, I'd like to say that I think um, in order to enhance trade or, or attract trade investment, I think favorable investment regime needs to be created. I think Africa is really a forerunner in, in that sense, you know, creating um, favorable investment climate for people to come and invest. I think what happens is when you do that, you build a lot of ancillary industry also around it. You know, I think Singapore actually is a leading example. They had a very small domestic market, but they actually brought in a lot of trade through preferential tax regime, preferential interest regime, investment regime. And I think that's a model that can be taken globally. The second is governance factor, which we need you touched upon. And I think that's, that's the need of the hour, you know. I think investments... Uh, particularly with regard to trade, people shy away when, when there is a corruption fear, when then there is a governance fear, you know, uh, ineffective judiciary. So I think these are broad uh, policy measures which need to be implemented if trade needs to be harnessed. I think that is one of the bigger inherent fears which you mentioned, you know, the psychological fears of dealing with Africa is corruption, sure. you know. So I think if, if that is done, I think trade would benefit significantly. Um, with With regard to... I think just the logistics of trade, I think, I think the discussion wouldn't be complete if the logistics of trade is not improved, you know, with regard to port infrastructure. I think there's a crying need now to improve right. that, not only in India, but also in Africa, because those are the gateways to those countries, you know. And second, of course, roads, you know. If somebody wants to set up shop, like for us, when we invested in Nigeria, I mean, there were two primary issues. There was no infrastructure with regard to roads, and there was great insecurity, to, to human life, you know, people didn't want to move from India to Nigeria to invest there. So I think, you know, there are, there are bigger macroeconomic issues, they can't be addressed immediately, but I think there's something which are long-term implementation measures which need to be kept in mind. Right, so uh, I want to take questions from the audience, but I do want to get both your opinions on solutions. So, Mohammed, quickly, if you have a few points that you would uh, like to Just a, a simple vehicle that I have seen here at the forum of a successful partnership between the private sector, government, with results, with fruits that are on the trees quite quickly. And uh, the example that comes to my mind is the, the Water Resources Group. Very quickly, this was a group that was set up to deal with water shortages worldwide. Countries like South Africa, for example, and Jordan, to take two specific examples, now India, recognize they have a water problem, but the government on its own doesn't have a clue. They don't have the resources needed to fix the problem. The forum comes in, brings to the table the right stakeholders. They get consultants who know about water, who come in and assess what the issue is. 
but working very closely with the government and with the NGOs on a very local level. It's an organization that doesn't cost a lot of money. It's very small and nimble, but it is proven and it is working. So I think it has to be this sort of a triangle business, but they have to be willing. I think the key ingredient to the solution is people who are willing and committed. Right, right. Vinny? I think a couple of suggestions. First is uh, votes, votes, and votes. Uh, I think we can, we can wish as much as we want. We have to link business actions with votes in terms of how would they generate votes. And therefore, the role of industry forums become very, very important. They have to link with action we desire and how they're going to link with votes. Uh, so creation of industry forums which, which, which make the linkage happen, that's number one. Number two, industry forums which are cross-border, not focused on the West, regional industry forums. Take an example of uh, the experiment with two experiments which are happening in Tamil Nadu. One is on water distribution and democratization of water. Uh, and the second which is happening is which is buying on e-auction all the medicine for the poor, which is resulting into a 90% discount. Uh, take one experiment in South Africa of teaching English to people who do not know English in about three months' time. Uh, how do we bring these experiments, even on social causes, right, and businesses, uh, together so that on that social pr platform these, these get discussed? Uh, unfortunately, there's no, no regional platform in which these options get discussed. And if they start get discussed at that forum, then the forum will start putting pressure on the government to try and do something about it. The last is the small businesses. The entrepreneurs are the people who bring about the change. The big business houses are useless because they already have many options. And you don't, you know, so they will mumble jumble quite a lot as I'm doing right now. But seriously, their actions are going to be quite limited. And therefore, how do we get small businesses excited about it, uh, excited about the opportunity and create forums where they can start pushing the government and pushing the the other businesses to try and collaborate. This, this will be three ideas for myself. Right. So uh, I'd like to take some questions from the audience, if there are any. Would you like to go uh, bring the mic, please? Hi, my name is Anshu Gaur. I had a question. If the panelists have examples of where trade is happening, and if so, why and how? Yeah, one of you take up the question. Because we, we heard a lot of examples of constraints, which are hard constraints, right. soft constraints, outside the control of a lot of people here. Right. So, so we certainly have enough successful examples over here. So yeah. I think we could take that up. So we, we are extremely successful in both Middle East and South Africa uh, with large houses in developing uh, IT solutions for them to try and make them more competitive because South African and the Middle East entities are seeing a significant advantage we have because we work with a lot of global corporations, with banks, with oil companies, with mineral companies, and therefore we have the capability to be able to execute for them uh, on a turnkey basis at a much lower cost than anybody else can do. So the bigger corporations in these countries get it, uh, and therefore there is a huge amount of success in this region. Our South Africa business is growing at about 78% year on year, Middle East is going at about 52% year on year, so yeah, that's success. Any other questions? Back there. Uh, you spoke about uh, setting up forums for entrepreneurs to bring about, uh, because you think that small companies and entrepreneurs can bring about change. Um, could you elaborate on that? So the, the point I was making is that uh, the, you know, if you are hungry, you fix the problem of hunger. If you are just had lunch and come and have a conversation on how to fix the poverty issue or the hunger issue, uh, you will speak a lot and speak extremely well, but you do nothing about it. So the question is, how do we connect the hungry people who are going to benefit the most out of that cooperation to own the change? And that can only happen as individually they are small by collecting them and pooling them together. So that collectively they are large. And collectively on one side, like the trade association in Punjab, right? the traders association and the agriculture association pushed the government quite a lot that they're going to gain tremendously out of the Pakistan collaboration. So how do we put them in a forum that collectively they suddenly become large, and with that large they A can influence A votes, and therefore the government policy, B similarly engage with the regional, other regional entrepreneur organization, 
and how can we make them bigger, you know, not just uh, lip service as we are doing right now, with more teeth so that they can determine what the association will do and how they will bring the ideas to the association so that you can grow. My all premise in any transformation, whether it was independence of India, is how do you connect people who have the highest pain with the highest gain? If you do that, the transformation would happen. Otherwise, we'll keep having such intellectual discussions and there will be no action. Uh, I'm uh, Rajiv Sodhi. Uh, uh, globalization is about uh, resourcing from the best possible source, uh, whether it's uh, manpower, whether it's material, raw material. So is there a, some kind of a common understanding about what are the strengths of each of these regions uh, and where one can source what, what kind of products or services? And is there a common kind of uh, understanding uh, between all the members that uh, you know these trends are, are there and we should leverage? So you give up the areas which are not our strengths and then leverage strengths from others, uh, whether it's minerals, it's raw materials. So one of the things that happened uh, for uh, Middle East was the petroleum, the, d the discovery of oil and gas. So everybody knows that's a place to source. Right. Similarly for tea, it's uh, Ceylon and India. So are there such things, uh, you know, which is uh, commonly known and uh, well advertised between government and people and businesses? Right, right. I mean, I think it's well understood that uh, Africa is a source of natural resources and India is labor. We have these comparative advantages, but Priyanka, do you have something um, you'd like to add? Um, I think he's talking about competitive advantages right. of countries and, you know, purely leveraging that. But I think what happens is there's an evolution to, to where the countries are in the value chain. You know, West is clearly the consumer, you know, exporting only the intellectual property, you know, with technology, etc. China has taken the lead on manufacturing. So, you know, it is, it is a manufacturer. And so what's happened is Africa inherently has then become the raw material provider to fuel that growth, you know, between China and the West. So I think it is where each country is in the value chain. Uh, India, I think India is a brilliant example of how we've moved up the value chain, you know, from this, as I mentioned earlier, from being a raw materials provider, you know, to now uh, the biggest exporter of, of soft uh, crate, you know, in um, IT, call centers, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's a lot of politics also to it rather than pure economic rationale. Um, there's, there's a lot of discussion now on, on climate change and restricting trade, you know, to reduce carbon footprinting. I don't know in, in an era in an era where where there is a, a great stress already because of, of man-made barriers how that would you know because that in it, in itself is a restrictor for trade you know uh, it is an enabler in one sense because you are forced to increase trade with your neighbors but I think it's a restrictor also because you know maybe Brazil needs something that India has and because there's you know there's it's very expensive from a freight perspective and from an environment perspective to get there. So you know you you restrict trade, uh, in in so there's there's no real answer you know as far as whether countries have outlined as to what they want to export. I think it's 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 purely a fiscal and and a political issue what what each right. country wants to do. I mean I, I just I mean also just to add to that I think to develop a competitive advantage in in a particular area you need to have the domestic support for it. You need to have the right domestic institutions and so. You know, what will be a uh, comparative advantage to the country is going to evolve over time as these institutions uh, develop. But there are clear, clear opportunities here uh, and strengths of these particular regions in terms of what, what they can be a global leader on. There any other questions? Is there somebody behind me that I'm not? Okay, right there. Yes, I had a question about, you know, trade has. Could you just introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Adash. Um, trade has some real costs. Um, I think the United States is a great example. We've had an election season recently. And it seems that um, for a significant segment of the population, perhaps a majority, real wages have stagnated for a significant long period of time, um, leading to social and personal costs. Um, how, how do we tackle that aspect of it? Um, and I think in India, that's one of the biggest fears and, and one of the biggest impediments to people sort of reforming and, and bringing about more change in, in, in sectors that employ a lot of people, like agriculture. So I guess I was interested in thoughts on how we manage that aspect and, and 
whether we speak enough on the very real sort of downsides of what can happen. Right. So I mean, so this is on the, uh, this is on a much more broader question of whether trade is good in some sense, which is beyond this particular region. Uh, and I'm going to have somebody else answer this question, but let me just throw in my point of view here. The there are always winners and losers in trade, even from a pure economic model perspective. The question is whether you can ensure that those who lose ultimately are better off. And just to the point about wage inequality and the stagnation of wages uh, in the US, I mean, I strongly don't think it has anything to do with, with trade, but because it's more because of skill bias, technological change. Uh, but is there anybody else who'd like to add something? Yeah, so I, I can't speak this in front of Geeta because she's an authority on this subject, so you should be answering this question. But if I could combine the two questions, and this question is very relevant in the fact that does the, question, the country ask itself what is its competitive advantage? Let's take India. Does India ask itself before opening FDI or any other you know, retail or anything like that, what is the competitive advantage it is trying to build? If it has, if it has a billion people, and that is the raw material it has, is it negotiating global mobility trade agreements while it is opening insurance and retail and other sectors in the country? If it is not, then you can, you can think about the fact that it will create employment, it may, it will improve trade, it may, it may, it will improve economy, it may, but if you were to look at global competitive agreements and saying, I have the people, I need global mobility, you need me for consumption, and therefore I will lower the trade barriers, because that's good for the world, and I will do that. At the same time, I do want you to lower the trade barriers on global mobility. If that's the negotiated trade agreement, which India and South Africa, these two countries, it's going to be very critical, were able to proactively approach, I think it's, a good, it's good for the country. If they don't, then hope is the best strategy. I think this is. <laughs> I think this is critical for India because I think with time the ambition is for India's biggest export is its talent, its uh, human resources. Now, can you export talent to Spain with such high youth unemployment? I think this is a very crucial point because looking forward, the vision has to be very clear. What are our assets? Are we protecting them long term? Take a place like Saudi Arabia, for example. Um, Saudis will not work outside of Saudi Arabia for cultural reasons. Um, and the Saudi government is trying to get people to work, the Saudis to work within their country by creating jobs, which means deleting existing jobs in Saudi Arabia. This is a very clear example within this region of one country that has a surplus, another country that doesn't want that surplus. But how do you protect that? I think this is why clarity in the vision is, is, is very important, so that they're choosing the right single propositions, the, the right products uh, to push, and the list can uh, go on. Any other questions? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, one quick question. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm Praveen Nair from New York University. I just have a quick question. Uh, in many of the trade discussions, as well as any other reform discussions, I actually don't like the word reform, because it kind of feels almost like uh, I've been penalized and sent to the penal system, and I need to be reformed. I don't understand why we don't use improvement. And if you talk to a sociologist or a psychologist, they tend to use you know, improvement, change of behavior, et cetera. I wonder whether in any of these discussions we actually involve sociologists to help us understand what to do next. Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, everybody gets their voice in this discussion. In, I mean, and this is a, obviously a much, again, a much broader question than are we even going past trade? You could talk about any reform and language for it. Uh, but I agree. I think. I think. Uh, the, the fact, you know, any reform has, for it to happen, there has to be consensus about it. Uh, and to generate consensus about the reform, I think communicating the, the ideas across and, you know, ensuring that all beneficiaries understand that they have something to gain from it uh, is, is important. So, you know, I think that, that this is, that's, uh, that's a crucial point. So we're coming to if the I end. Can, if I can add a point yeah. there. I, I think it's an interesting question from a different side of the coin. 
what we have been discussing so far is what I call material change, change in policy, you know, change in trade. Or, right. What I think, uh, what Praveen is trying to say is that, is it possible for, like organizations, if they want to bring about a transformation in their future, they do what we, what we call continuous improvement. Right? They don't come up with a policy and saying, suddenly we're going to go east, or suddenly we're going to west. It's, it's a slow process, and it's what I call experimental in nature, it's uh, incremental in nature, and it is improvement in nature. And therefore, there is no one decision uh, which leads to a significant change. And I think the interesting part to think about in this particular topic is that do we need incremental change uh, rather than one big policy change? And can we create those forums for incremental change? And is the solution around incremental change rather than one big policy change? Right. Uh, would you like to, uh, to respond to something along those lines? Would you say that we should have incremental change or should we go in for a big bang reform? I think we need both, you know, because incremental change bring about those micro improvements that actually fine tune the entire system. Right. And I think a, a big bang, such as a policy change, which reduce tariff barriers, you know, would create a more enabling environment to facilitate trade, bring that top end thing. So I think it's a function of both. I don't think it's an either or. Um, but I think continuous improvement is is more done by corporates, civil society, consumers, you know, because they they actually, I think it's done very organically, wherein demand supply itself balances it out. You know, there's continuous improvement in product services. And I think government, through its policy, um, regulation mechanism, um, you know, preferential uh, investment climate, brings about that top-end facilitator role, you know, for enabling trade. Right. So, okay, I think we are running out of time, so I want to thank our panelists. And I, it looks like we had it. We had a good discussion. I think we agree that there are clear opportunities, both in terms of markets to sell to and markets to source from uh, that are untapped. Uh, it's, it's also interesting that one of the things that came up in terms of what needs to be done to grow this trade is actually have to have more forms of discussion. I, sometimes I think we have one too many of those, but apparently not enough. Um, and, it, and it looks like in terms of actually Growing this in a significant way, the challenges are exactly the same as the challenges of growing these economies, which is about actually implementing the change. Right? I mean, I think everybody, again, understands what needs to be done, uh, but it's hard to get things done when you're trying to deal with these regions. Apparently, things move very slowly. Decisions don't get taken. Uh, but clearly, if that can change, and that might require consensus at the top, uh, of, of bringing in the right policy uh, changes that clearly are uh, large gains from trade in this region, and not just trade from an economic point of view, but through uh, transfers of social technology uh, that we've, uh, we've already talked about. So thank you so much, um, and thank you for your uh, very insightful points.